let's talk about hard minerals and hard resources. Mm -hmm. Obviously, iron ore is the big talking mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Down from peaks of $150 a tonne thereabouts, down mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. earlier in the year $130 a tonne. Now down to collapsing, yeah. you know, sub $65 mm -hmm. um, a tonne. Similar to the oil story, it is a uh, discussion around the supply and demand factors. But we saw the noticeable drop in August or. Uh, as we came into the new financial year. In part, uh, that was due to the fact that the Chinese were starting to slow down. The Chinese economy has slowed to a point where some commentators are forecasting or expecting that their GDP growth rate would actually be sub-7. Yeah. Um, for the bulk, we're still saying that it could be 7.1, 7.2, which we'll take, yep. but others are actually um, quoting a figure of sub seven. Now the Chinese do have a big war chest, mm -hmm. so they could put some stimulus into their marketplace. Mm -hmm. They're obviously concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, just with obviously, you know, Chinese house mm -hmm. prices have been a, a real problem mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. they're keeping that powder dry for now. Mm -hmm. And from a, from, a, from a point of view around our markets, that obviously has had a big impact in terms of the confidence on our markets mm -hmm. and our mining sector, hasn't it? Look, I certainly, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic with China at this stage, um, heading into the next 12, 18 months, in that it has slowed down. Part of the reason why they were slowing it down, it was an intentional slowing. Um, if we go back a few years where Chinese inflations were above five, mm. that was a concern. Growth rates at 10% yeah. is a concern for the, for the, for the government. Yeah. So it's been a strategic decision by them to slow it down a little bit and also re-engineer their economy to go from an export base to more a consumer base. Yep. Um, and one of the key things that has uh, uh, come out of that is that the inflation rate is actually down to around about the 2% mark, which is that natural rate that most um, Federal Reserves or the Treasury is generally trying to target. So with that coming down to the 2% level, we've seen that the Chinese government is prepared to stimulate where need be to keep that in, uh, growth rate above seven. And we saw that late last year where they cut rates for the first time in about two years or so. I mean, if we keep it simple, their agenda is they want to see their nation, their people, mm -hmm. having a better quality of life mm -hmm. and a better standard mm -hmm. of living. Mm -hmm. So through that comes consumption of goods and, and you know, drive service industry, mm -hmm. manufacturing industry, and, and that's what they're talking that's about. Right. You know, 1.3 billion people getting that economy moving internally as opposed yeah. to be a net exporter of goods. It's interesting in that, uh, yeah, this year, 2015, uh, is coming to the end of the Chinese five-year plan, which they announced back in 2010. And at that time, the key three things that they were talking about with regards to the five-year plan was to go west, to go internal, and to go green. So that is around about um, essentially making a better life for the Chinese uh, people. So does that tell a story around our markets? Let's just fly around the globe and have a look at the different marketplaces and then come back to that story. Because what I want to get out of you before we finish today is an insight into areas of, of industry and, and certain business ideas. I, are you big on energy? Are you looking at you know defensive stocks? What's the sort of play that you're looking at around that? So let's start with the US, the biggest yep. economy yep. in the world. Where, where do you see the markets? Look, the US has been the stellar performer over the last uh, 2014, I should say, and it's still got the key ingredients or characteristics for them to push forward with regards to the economic growth on that side of things. Um, with the drop in oil prices, again, that theoretically can push their um, GDP out uh, a bit further as well. Um, last year, in fact, their GDP numbers were around about 5%. So again, with the uh, drop in oil prices, that would be a lot of benefit to them. Um, so what we're looking at, at there overseas or in the US particularly is the consumption factor. Mm. Now, US unemployment has actually dropped to a point where it's less than Australia. It's currently 5.8. Yeah. Um, and they generally take off around about 0.1 of a percent every month. So to get to that natural rate of unemployment where we see 5 to 5.5, 5, yeah. we're talking somewhere between March 2015 to June. Once we get to a, a full employment scenario, that's where we may see, give it three or four months or so, um, we will see price or salary inflation. Because yep. uh, one of the issues that the US is going through is that whilst employment has actually been filled up, their salary increases haven't necessarily yeah. caught up. There's in been life. wage stagnation. Right. Um, we've obviously got the quantitative easing 
um, you know, sort of the rollback of, mm -hmm. of that type of thing, and, and that's being well communicated to the market. Mm -hmm. there, are, are we seeing mm -hmm. that sort of those steps taking place, yeah. sort of second yeah. half yeah. of 2015? Yeah, look, the, um, last year one of the big concerns was about uh, the quantitative easing and when it would stop. And we've certainly gotten past that. So the question now is, when will the interest rates officially increase? Again, if we went back six months ago, the expectation was that the first rate increase would be March of this year. Mm. But with the oil prices going down, again, impacting the inflation numbers, it gives the Federal Reserve some capacity to hold off. Yep. Um, so it could quite be foreseeably, uh, foreseeably yeah. in the latter half of this year or even carried over into 2016. So equity markets have had a fairly good run over there, obviously outperformed our local market. Um, and a lot of that uh, potentially through the government stimulus that's gone on. Mm -hmm. Do you still see some scope in, in their marketplace improving over the course of the next 12 months? Look, I think the, um, the certainly no doubt over the last six years, the quantitative easing has allowed the markets to run quite hard over the US. Yeah. Um, with respect to the earnings, uh, and that was the concern last year when we thought that when quantitative easing comes back, cheap money is out of, yep. earnings will come off. Yep. However, on the flip side of that is that if the US consumers start spending, yep. the real numbers will start to pick up and therefore the top line, the profit numbers, should hopefully be able to be maintained. Should that be the case, then it's quite possible for the US to maintain uh, their trajectory. So your read is more optimistic than pessimistic on the US market? I'm probably more neutral okay. on that side of things because yep. it's still hard to gauge uh, uh, the reduction in, or the increase in interest costs yep. from the quantitative easing, yep. uh, but also the flip side, the pickup in revenue or consumer spending. Okay, so neutral in US. Yeah. Let's move across to Europe. Um, let's have a look at the Europe story mm -hmm. and, and what do you read into that? Europe uh, may not necessarily be a popular view, but I'm probably more optimistic in terms of where to place your money in Europe yep. than I am in the US. Okay. In part because their inflation rates are quite low, yep. the unemployment levels um, Notwithstanding the fact that the European Union is a collective of number of countries um, that doesn't necessarily want to do everything the same way, yep. Yep. Um, notwithstanding that, there, there's, there is a little bit more capacity. So what I'm looking at is predominantly around capacity. Yep. The US, as it approaches full employment, will have capacity issues, yep. uh, whereas Europe necessarily won't. So and there's a lot of upside and capacity um, and political stability. Can I interrupt there yeah. and, and ask yeah. about, so obviously that's going to be a big mm. read mm. for the markets. That's it? right. So the, the two big issues there in, in Europe um, is that the market generally, or a lot of commentators are expecting that the, U, uh, the, the European Union will start their version of quantitative easing soon. Yeah. So that's the other reason why we're a little bit more bullish in, in, in that space. Um, on the other hand, this year we'll see quite a few elections um, mm. in, in, in Europe, I starting with Greece. And, yeah. We've got the UK coming up as well. Yep. Um, now, a lot of these elections are around, well, the Greeks had to actually uh, call an early election yes. um, because there is a large portion of the population that doesn't necessarily agree with the austerity uh, yep. policies that have been put yep. in place. And that's, look, that, that's nothing's really changed in that sense. They're not seeing any quick runs on the mm -hmm. board. Mm -hmm. So I think from that point of view, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's talk about them leaving the union. Mm -hmm. and so that could stir up a little bit of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. but, but on the whole, you think that there's a little bit more upside? On the whole, um, there's a little bit more upside. We're not talking ridiculous um, three plus numbers in terms of GDP, but to mm. go probably, um, even if we go uh, in the mid ones, yep. um, it's certainly a little bit more um, uh, optimistic. So from, from an where equity market's point of view, some opportunity there. there. Some okay. opportunity there. Um, Japan, do you want to make Japan. a comment on Japan? Look, I'll probably put Japan and that whole Southeast Asian region, um, including China together, okay. um, in part because the the Japanese have been working on their quantitative easing um, policies over the last couple of years. Yep. There's probably a little bit left to go on that. Um, the reason why I put it together with that, the, the Asian area is, again, addressing the consumption factors with regards to the US, yep. but also domestic Chinese consumption and also Japanese consumption. Yep. Um, coming back to that emerging markets, maybe jumping the gun a little, uh, but with regards yep. to the emerging market side of things, with regards to the oil, Certain emerging markets, such as Russia and Venezuela, yep. will struggle a lot with regards to the oil price. Yes. Whereas emerging market countries that are more manufacturing based, that can fulfil the requirements of the consumers, yep. will actually do better. So India? So India, China, Brazil. Taiwan, 
not so much Brazil. They're more commodity based. Okay. Um, okay. But um, certainly India, Taiwan, um, China. Right. The, the manufacturing base. So a little bit more bullish mm. on in that in that sector. Absolutely. Fantastic. So, notwithstanding, there's always a caveat. To of course, always a caveat. Always um, a caveat. Is is again with regards to the oil price. What it's actually doing to um, some of these other countries, emerging market countries, is that it has a political impact on some of these countries with respect to there's less revenue coming into their uh, their economy. Mm, yes. Therefore, they will have fiscal less issues. So, if we look at Russia, which we had a little bit of a scare late last year, yep. should they default? that will have obvious impacts with the emerging market okay. um, economies. So let's look at the sectors. So. Um